morning or good afternoon, wherever you may be, uh, to, and welcome to another Holden Safari's Fireside Chat. And today uh, we're talking to our partners with whom we have a strategic alliance, Manyago Safaris, based in Nairobi. They, of course, if you remember, oversee all of our safaris in uh, the region of East Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, and uh, Seychelles. And so welcome Manyago. And Manyago today has brought with them a very special guest who I'll now ask Annabella, Annabella Francescan, uh, the chairman of uh, Manyago Safaris. And with her, she has her colleague, Peter Karanja. He's the managing director of uh, Manyago Safaris. So welcome to the two of you. And Annabella, if you would please introduce our special guest for the day. Hello, everybody. Uh, what can I say about Jonathan Scott? That is who our special guest is today. He is known worldwide for his love of wildlife and Kenya, as portrayed in his many books, his drawings, and his documentaries, which he has presented. On a personal note, Jonathan has been a friend for many, many years. Our paths first crossed in the Maasai Mara as he started following the famous Marsh Pride. Right? Jonathan is a man perfectly in tune and at peace with nature. He works tirelessly at trying to get the world to understand the importance of nature through all the media he is so proficient at. Right, Jim, Jonathan, over to you. Thank you, Annabella, and welcome, Jonathan. Thank you. Um, and, you know, we all go back quite a ways, um, uh, if you recall, um, Manyago, Annabella, Peter and I used to uh, work with Abercrombie and Kent and of course Jonathan you were very much uh, part of that operation uh, work, uh, helping with uh, clients who were on safari etc and sharing of course um, your wonderful photography and the books that, that, that you write but before we go any further Jonathan I have a burning question that I do need to ask you so we're both of a similar age, I know. And how is it, Jonathan, that you still have a whole head of hair when the rest of us are losing it? What is the secret, Jonathan? Please share that. <laughs> well, I think what I love to say to people as I'm talking, say, at a, uh, an event in London or somewhere, and uh, I bring up an image, a slide, a picture of a cheetah who we call Kike, meaning female. And um, she used to jump up on the cars. And in these, this was in 2003, and we were filming Big Cat Week, so the television show um, that was shown around the world. And uh, this particular cheetah jumped up onto the bonnet of my car, and then she jumped up and sat next to the open roof hatch of my vehicle. And I, of course, this was an amazing TV moment. I've got a cameraman standing or sitting next to me and I turned to the camera which would be talking to you and I said there's only one cheetah that does this and her name is Kike and of course the thing that people loved about these shows was that we knew these animals as individuals and then I looked up through my open roof hatch because she was sitting on the lid of the roof hatch it was a single roof hatch right over my head and as I looked up she stood and she presented her hindquarters right over my open hatch. Oh my goodness. Yeah, and then she crapped and peed through the open hatch. So I always say to people, I mean, it was one of those moments that if I'm in England or New York or somewhere, not every day, but I'll see somebody coming down the street towards me and they start laughing. And I just know what they're gonna say. They'll say, aren't you that bloke? You're the bloke from Big Cat. They won't know what my name is necessarily. You're the guy that you crapped on. So I, I say to people like you, Jim, the only way to get hair like this is to be crapped on by a cheetah every day for a month of filming. And then you'll have oh. hair like me. Well, you know, Jonathan, that's probably going to be, not to diminish what's coming up, but that's probably going to be the most valuable takeaway for the ladies in the audience that you know what this is the latest hair care product to come out of kenya is bottled cheetah pee exactly uh, now don't panic 
Don't panic, Jim, as I leave my seat, because I'm coming back. With a bottle of cheetah pee? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, while Jonathan's retrieving... Um, okay, he's, 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 oh, he's, he's back. Yeah, you see? Yes. Oh, my goodness. It's in there, is it? The story's told in there? That's the cheetah. And, of course, we no longer encourage people to do that to let cheetahs come on the card because you know as wonderful as it was and we were very respectful you know we didn't touch the cheetah we wanted to keep that distance and of course you wouldn't want a lion or leopard up on your roof hatch but cheetahs for a cheetah it was just like jumping up on a termite mound get yes. to an elevated yeah. position have a look round, and then take a poo yeah but generally not on i did catch fortunately she didn't have an upset stomach but i caught the first couple and then, blow me, she landed one right down the lens Jonathan, hood. Of Jonathan, I think, you know, we have an expression for that here in America. It's called TMI, too much information. Okay, yeah, that, was, yeah. that was my cue, yeah. wasn't it? When you said to me, you wanted me, when you wanted me to stop talking, it was TMI. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I just want for our audience to uh, realize that, of course, uh, we're here, I'm here sitting in America and Jonathan is in uh, Nairobi along with our um, partners uh, at, in Manyago. And so Jonathan, um, I want you to start off please by just giving some of your uh, background, your history, how you ended up in uh, Nairobi because I think you hail originally from England. And of course you do have a connection with uh, reading your um, lengthy biography, you do have a and, and lengthy career, of course, you do have a connection with America because you've done a lot of your film work and photography and books, etc., over here in America. So, uh, some of our audience may well be familiar with you. And of course, um, I, I think of you very much as, uh, you know, Nairobi's own David Attenborough. I mean, there you are out in the wilds, uh, uh having animals, um, uh, do their bathroom habits over you, etc. You get very close to them, just like David Attenborough does. So, give us a little, a little insight uh, into how you ended up doing what you do, uh, and based in uh, based in Nairobi, if you would please. Okay, so the short version: I was born in England. I was brought up on a farm in Berkshire. And my love of nature, I could always draw. So I was always, you know, moving around the farm, uh, looking for badgers and foxes and all of that kind of stuff. But at the same time, I would watch wildlife movies, Armin and Michaela Dennis on safari, uh, people like Alan Root, people who were living in Africa. And, you know, foxes, badgers, stoats, weasels, squirrels, yeah, they're okay. But how could they compare? with those kind of majestic animals. So yeah. I always, from a little kid, I subscribed to the wildlife magazines and I'm gonna make you laugh because in fact, we actually, there was an opportunity to get um, little cards which were tucked into the inside packet of a tea, a tea packet. And it, you know, it was to encourage you to buy the tea and you'd get these little cards of British wildlife. So we would every week get Taifu tea so as I, little Johnny, could get his little card and post it into his thing. So I was completely passionate about wildlife. Wow. Anyway, so I then went to university in Ireland and studied zoology. And at the end of my four years, and I loved it. So again, it was more about wildlife, whatever it is, but it made me laugh because at the end of the four years, my professor said to me, what are you going to do next? Are you going to do a PhD? So I said, oh, no, forget it. I don't want to be in a lab. You know, I didn't say to him, I don't want to be like you and be sort of institutionalized. I said, what I want to do, I want to be like those people who go out to Africa on safari. I want to see lions, leopards, and cheetahs. And he just looked at me like a father would. And he said, and by any chance, is your father very wealthy? Do you have, <laughs> yeah. He said, do you have a private income? So I said, no. He said, well, very nice thought. He said, but you better get a job. 30 years later, when Big Cat Diary was on television in the UK, he wrote to me and he oh. said, the best thing you ever did was to follow your dream. So, got my degree. I saw an advertisement. I wanted to hitch across Africa. And I saw an advertisement for 500 pounds. So, let's say $1,000, a four-month trip in a Bedford truck from London to Johannesburg. I mean, imagine, all the way down through the Sahara, 
to West Africa, through Central Africa, through the Congo or Zaire as it was, through East Africa to South Africa. But when I got to East Africa and I saw the Mara Serengeti, I had that, this is it. Because of course it was East Africa, which in all due respect to South Africa, we all know East Africa is the place to go. You know, let's go to South Africa later. First, come to East Africa, because Savannah Africa, those wide open spaces of the Mara Serengeti, covered with wildebeest, lions, leopards, cheetahs, that was, so I knew this is it. So when I ended up in South Africa, I sort of had to think, I had an onward boat ticket to Cape Town, from Cape Town to Sydney in Australia. <laughs> Sold that, left South Africa because it was apartheid. Oh my God, I didn't want to be there. I went to Botswana first for two years doing various wildlife projects, stayed on a houseboat in the amazing Okavango Delta, and then bought a car with a friend, a minibus, converted it, long range tanks, six months, six weeks back overland to Kenya. And I bumped into a guy I'd been at university with. And I said, oh God, you know, I'd do anything to just, just live in the bush, do something. And he said, you know, very difficult, but I was introduced to Jack Block of Block Hotels. And he said, I can help you. And I met a guy called Jock Anderson, who you will have known of, who owned Mara River Camp, which was started by Alan Root and Richard Leakey, Root and Leakey Safaris. They wanted somebody, didn't want to pay them, couldn't have the money, had no money to pay. And I went down to go and keep an eye on it, start doing my drawings, learn to be a little bit better of a photographer. And I said, I don't care if I don't get paid as long as I can go and learn the area, become a guide. And so that's exactly what happened. That's how I ended up in the Mara. And that was 30 years ago. No, that was 70, 1977. Wow. 43 years ago. Wow. Well, Amazing. wonderful. Yeah. And you know, Jim, for the first two years, three years, no salary, nothing. But every day I would drive one of Jock's Land Rovers out and I had a mentor and his name was Joseph. And Joseph was Buana Chui, which you would know in Swahili, Mr. Leopard. And actually, as Annabella said earlier, you know, came to the Mara, ended up following the marshlands, the most famous lands in the world now through Big Cat Diary. And my dream when I came to Africa, because as a kid, I used to go to London Zoo and I'd stand in front of the leopard enclosure and I would long this secretive, elusive, beautiful cat, which hides away a lot of the time. That was really what I wanted to follow. But when I arrived in the Mara in those days, very tough. There had been a lot of poaching. They estimated in Africa as a whole, 50,000 leopards were being killed a year for the fur trade. So oh, I put God. following leopards on hold. But Buana Chui, every so often, would say to me, Jonathan, you want to see a leopard? I'd say, do I want to see a leopard? He said, come with me. And he took me to a place called Leopard Gorge. And he showed me a very shy female. Well, he didn't show me. He told me where she was, who had had cubs. Six years later, I did my book on leopards. Took six years, The Leopard's Tale. Anyway, on we go. Well, Jonathan, uh, it's fascinating. And of course, uh, with your illustrious and long career, uh, we could we could go on and on and on. But let's ask Please. you for, for our clients here at Holden Safaris, uh, and their agents, their travel advisors, as they're called here in the States, what would you recommend if they wanted to um, uh, take one book or one film that you've made or documentary, if there was one that you felt illustrated um, your best work or something you found incredibly memorable, what would it be? What should they go and look for and either watch as a documentary or buy as a book to get a greater understanding of your work and what you're trying to portray through your work about the fabulous wildlife in Africa? Well, if they, you know, if you just Google Big Cat Diary, it ran from 1996 until 2008. It ran for 12 years. 
and uh, you know was one of the most popular wildlife television series ever uh, and I say that you know without self-aggrandizement because the length of it you know I mean every year we would say are we going to manage to pull this off will we find something different and of course the Maasai Mara, which where I was based and with my wife, Angie, who is also a wonderful, um, or I should say not also, she is a wonderful wildlife photographer. I drive the car and get her into the right position. But um, that television series, I mean, for instance, when that cheetah, you know, did the business, seven million people in England alone watched that. So Big Cat Diary, but let's get up to date. We have a television series right now on Animal Planet called Big Cat Tales. And if you don't have Animal Planet, you can go onto iTunes or you can go on to Amazon Prime and for a few dollars you can download Big Cat Tales. And you will be blown away because as I say to people, if I had one day left in my life, where would I choose to spend it? And, and it has never, I've been to Antarctica, I've been to India, I've been around the world in search of wonderful wildlife viewing and great images. And Angie would say the same. The Maasai Mara would be where I would go with Angie. It was where we were married. It was where our kids grew up in the back of our car. I still, to this day, as I start to get on a, you know, into my vehicle, our vehicle and start driving down towards the Mara, I feel that excitement because I know that I'm gonna see this unbelievable place. And not only that, I'm going to reunite myself with some of these big cat characters because that's what people loved about the TV shows. We brought them alive because we know them as individuals. They're not our friends. We didn't wanna pet them or hug them or do any of the crazy stuff. I had somebody, I heard the door open one time on I'm on Safari and a Japanese client was opening the door because the lions were rolling around near to the car with the mothers and the little cubs. I said, holy God, what are you doing? He said, I want to play with them. <laughs> well, Jonathan, that's, that's a lovely segue uh, into what I wanted to ask you next. Uh, and what you've just said is very helpful because uh, all of our clients, um, those that uh, have heard anything about uh, Africa and Safari, you're quite right, want to go, if it's the first time, uh, where's he disappeared? He probably disappeared to get a book. He'll be back. Um, right. What about a book? Now, yeah. okay, um, we've, what have we done? We've done 35 books. You see these books? Yes. Yep. Yes. Yes. These books are not only beautifully illustrated, but they are perfect for people who come on Safari. You don't have to buy them in the States or you can go online and find them. But Jonathan and Angela Scott's Safari Guides to East African Birds and East African Animals. I'm, I'm, making, look, I'm making note of it. Safari yeah. Guide. And uh, Peter know them. Look. Safari Guide. Say, say again. Safari Guides. Jonathan and Angela Scott's Safari Guide to East African Birds and East African Animals. Right. And the reason, the reason I mention them is this. When I first came to Africa, there was lots of very good identification guides. John Williams, Birds of East Africa, Animals, Mammals of East Africa, identification guides. But as a zoologist, somebody who was fascinated by what the animals did, how long did they live? How many babies did they have? What's the gestation period? How much did they weigh? How long are they? You know, what is, are they social or solitary? I didn't just want to identify the animals, but I couldn't find any books with that information, which you didn't feel like you were reading the Encyclopedia Britannica, where you got a beautiful picture or pictures, you got the behavior, and you learned something about what the animal did, how it lived. Yeah, no, and that's... So, and so for guides, these are some... The, you know, the, these are incredible, and Peter will tell you, Annabella will tell you, with guides and with guests, you know, when we're out in the Mara, somebody will drive up and, and they'll say, we love this book. Yeah. You know. Uh, well, wonderful. So, Jonathan, we, 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 uh, if it isn't on our uh, uh, book list that we send to clients as a suggested reading list, uh, we will definitely add them. And I assume they're readily available on uh, all the normal sources, Amazon, the main one, of course. Um, I assume you can get them there. You know, to be honest, Jim, they, 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 when they arrive, you know, with Annabella and she's there 
um, you know, there's always shopping opportunities or they can request that somebody picks up a copy for them and it's there for them when they're off, you know, ready to go on safari. Yeah. In fact, I mean, I might even make a suggestion to Annabella that she has them in her vehicles. Um, that, uh, you know, there's a copy in each vehicle because that will uh, that'll help enormously. Clients, of course, like to, we always advise them, as you know, Jonathan, to travel light because of the uh, small aircraft. So lugging your light. books, I don't know how heavy they are, but they look pretty uh, comprehensive, yes. But uh, oh, what a wonderful, thank you for that information. Now, in the interest of time, uh, Jonathan, we need to uh, move along. And uh, you mentioned um, the Japanese uh, client climbing out the back of the Jeep. And uh, what I was interested, um, and I'm sure our audience will be similarly interested to know, that when they're out on safari, uh, they can actually have an audience with you in that you will join them around the campfire uh, of an evening, or you may even spend a day with them sharing your um, encyclopedic knowledge of the wildlife around them, but also um, maybe help them a little bit with their photography. So could you share with us what you actually do, uh, what should a client expect? Let's put it that way. What should a client expect when um, you join them for an evening or a day out on safari? And what might they learn? And what do you learn from them? What what is what has surprised you about what a client might say? Uh, obviously, nothing as extreme as the Japanese fellow jumping out the back of the Jeep. But uh, do, are you surprised that sometimes their comments, um, because... Uh, we're very conscious that, you know, we, we have grown up, those of us who've grown up in Africa, everything's very familiar, you get used to it, you take it for granted. Uh, but our clients are coming from America, and of course America has even less familiarity with Africa than parts of Europe. And so for them, it's a, it, everything is totally new. So I'd be fascinated to know what insights you can share uh, from the time you spent with clients on safari. You know, I, th I think what we can offer is we can add value because you could go to the Mara, to Samburu, to Serengeti. You could stay in a $200 camp or lodge or you could stay in a $1,000 camp or lodge. Um, but the bottom line is when you drive out, everybody has access to the same opportunities. So you'll still see lions, leopards, cheetahs, elephants, whatever it is, everybody, the guides know where to take you, whether you're staying at Richard Branson's camp or you're staying as a backpacker, like I was in a, in a safari vehicle. But what, you, what everybody doesn't get is the opportunity to have added value by having somebody like us come along who, and I can promise you this, in a single day, I can change the way, unless you're a professional photographer, in which case, you know, it, it might be a little bit, but I, I, even with professional photographers, because we're the people on the ground with the inside information about the animals, who's got cubs? Is there a leopard with cubs? What's the best approach? Where's the best light? You know, what, what is it that you can add? We can obviously add, even for the professional photographer, ways that we can get them into situations which will allow them to get their pictures. But the bottom line is within a single day, or in a single afternoon, we can transform the way you see the world. Because photography is all about seeing. It's about understanding the light. It's not about how big your telephoto lens is. It's not about whether you shoot Canon or Nikon or Panasonic or Sony. It's about you. And it's about learning to visualize the pictures you want to take. So if it's photography, yeah. And of course, we always come with a high powered projector so as we can show videos, we can show the equivalent of slideshows. You know, we can show you images and we can show you examples of how you do this and do that, whatever. But the bottom line is, we're very versatile. If you want to talk about politics, we can talk about politics. You want to know about what is it like, you know, here locally, whatever's going on with the politics, you know, with conservation. So basically, and I think this is one of the most important things I was talking to you about it, uh, about guiding. And of course, what I would always say to people is, is this, you know, if you're coming on safari, forget about hiring us, do your research work. There is no excuse to come to Africa in the wrong season, 
in the wrong vehicle, if you're a photographer and you haven't researched what kind of vehicle you've got, with not the very best guide that you can hire, because believe me, you're going to spend 12 hours in your vehicle and you're going to be asleep in the camp. You know, it's about the vehicle and the experience on the ground. And so we can obviously add significantly to that. But as I said to you, we're very versatile and we're very intuitive. If I, as I said, drive out with somebody and I spot a lilac breasted roller, or let's make it a bit more difficult, you know, a, a yellow fronted cuckoo or some, something, you know, and I stop and I say, oh my, look, you know, there it is. And nobody reacts. I know that people are not that interested in ornithology. The trip is about the guest. Yes. It's not about me. <clears throat> and what we want to give is 110% of our time and expertise to add value to your trip. So as you go away thinking, you know, okay, what were the highlights? Well, we would hope that our presentations and our input, because packed into a single day, you can get extraordinary value. I mean, and, and you mentioned David Attenborough, who without, you know, again, self-aggrandizement is a good friend. I've taken him on safari. I even managed to, oh, can you imagine? I went to dinner with him and his wife in London to meet up with some other friends and whatever it is. I missed the last train home. Oh Being my back. goodness. So you had to go yeah. home with him? No. He had to put me in the spare room with all the camera cases and all the paintings and whatever it is. And guess what? I thought to myself, I am going to be up and out of here with embarrassment before anybody rises in the morning. Some chance. Knock, knock. David Attenborough with a cup of tea. How many oh, people? Oh, wonderful. Can... Yeah. So, oh, you know, yeah. the bottom, but the bottom line, the bottom line is this. <clears throat> there will be some people who simply want to come or have us join them on safari. We get people writing to us who maybe now are professors of zoology, who are wildlife photographers, who will say to you, we grew up with Big Cat Diary. We grew up with, you know, reading your books or listening to, you know, whatever it might be. And they just want to sit and chat in the same way that I would love to sit and chat with this person or that person who is an expert in the area that I am currently interested in. Yeah. So there uh, you Jonathan, I think I, uh, um, that's, that's wonderful to hear and will be music to the ears of our clients because uh, what, I've, what I've learned since living here in the States uh, is American clients love to learn. Um, they don't want to just be passive, uh, as you said earlier, and uh, bump around in a Jeep, uh, having someone point out elephants, uh, pretty obvious. They want to learn about the habits of the elephants, etc. So they are, they're fascinated. But one thing I notice um, we get repeated over and over again is clients when they come back say, I never realized how close you get to the wildlife mm -hmm. because they thought uh, that only happens in a zoo. And when they'd be out on the plains of the Mara, where you've done most of your work, they thought they would have to be looking through those long telephoto lens, etc. But no, in fact, they come back and they complain. I couldn't use my wide angle. I mean, I use my wide angle. I couldn't use the telephoto. The blooming lion wouldn't stand back and let me take a picture of him. So similarly, what sort of strange things have you learned from your American uh, uh, clients that you've engaged with uh, uh, over the years? You know, just, just before I get onto that, and, and I love Americans. My son lives in America. He went to university in America. I lived in America for a year when I first left university before I went to Africa, thinking about what the next step was being. I was working on building construction, bought a, a th can you imagine? I bought a $300 Comet Mercury. Oh my goodness, with fins. At Comet Mercury. And I slept, I traveled all over the States and I slept in the back. I got into all kinds of trouble. I wrote the car off, made a right-hand turn, suddenly forgot I was in America and thought I was in Britain, made a right-hand turn, crashed, destroyed the car in Biloxi, Mississippi, had to hitch, took me three days back to New York. Anyway, I love the American, you know, the enthusiasm, the, 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 the energy, and, and just so I, I really relate very well to that experience. But I think just to touch on something that you and I talked about earlier too, one of the things also that I love 
And I think Annabella and Peter would absolutely, the new way of traveling to me is, you know, a lot of people used to think I'm going on safari and I'm going to five, 10 different locations. Whoopee. We're going to Amboseli, Samburu, we're going to Savo, we're going to go down to Namanga, we're going to, you know, we're going to go to Meru, the Mara, you know, we, we, we're going to do it all. Oh God, you never get time to actually unpack your bag. And as you and I said the other day, come for 10 days, make it two weeks, and just go to two places. Go to the Mara, go maybe up to Laikipia, one of the private ranches, up to Samburu, you know, there's a load of places slow down we have a name for it jonathan we have a name for it we call it stay longer dive deeper this is it so now to get back to the the thing about you know the, the you know being with american visitors and stuff i mean i i just find it such to me i love storytelling i love communicating i like to hear you might not think so but i like to hear other people's stories too one of the great joys of travel is to meet people to be in an extraordinary location and to be able to share in the reverie of saying, oh my God. And in fact, our latest book is a big portfolio book called Sacred Nature, Reconnecting People to Our Planet. Because one of our missions now, at this point in our life, you know, what wisdom do we know? We know that a lot of people have become separated from nature. 60% of people live in cities. A lot of people don't even go and walk out into the local park. And a lot of people have got, you know, they live their life through their computer. We would encourage people because it's good for your health. It's good for your psychology, mental health, physical health, whatever it is. You need to reconnect to nature because unfortunately, we now find ourselves in recent times feeling that we can live without nature or by doing what we like to nature and of course we got bitten in the backside in terms of forest fires melting glaciers pandemics what do we need to hear anything else we've got to change yeah, our way well funny it, it, interesting you say that jonathan because of course that i understand has been one of the uh, impacts of the pandemic is that um uh, obviously, there's, uh, there's a downside, there's an upside. But one of the upsides is that uh, with a dearth of clients running around places like the Mara uh, and in South Africa and the Kruger, uh, the wildlife has taken over. So they're now using the roads to commute from uh, wherever they might have slept at night to the hunting grounds. Much easier to follow the road. Uh, and they're lolling around all over the place enjoying it. And you might be interested in this little anecdote uh, because it comes from the BBC in England that they recorded bird song somewhere uh, in a park in London uh, before the pandemic and then recorded it after the pandemic. And the differences were stark. Um, before the pandemic, the birds could hardly be heard because of the traffic noise, the noise of the city of London around the park. And post pandemic, the birds had changed their song because they could hear each other. And now they were actually using different song, et cetera, to attract their mates and so on, and at a different pitch, because they actually now could be heard. Fascinating insight. So Jonathan, I want to move on, but in the interest of time, um, tell us a little anecdote that was memorable for one reason or another uh, from your uh, career with clients, um, American clients preferably, but it could be anybody. You mentioned the Japanese fellow jumping out the back. That could have ended very badly. Um, have you had any other incidents uh, that are memorable, interesting, funny as regard to interaction with clients on a safari? Well, you know, it's interesting because when we lived at Kichwatembo, which was Abercrombie and Kent originally owned, owned the camp called Kichwatembo. In the Masai Mara. Yeah. Yep. And when Bill and Melinda Gates were on their honeymoon, we were invited down to join them for dinner. And so, you know, we were in, very excited, obviously, to, to listen to Bill Gates. And we were basically tasked with telling him about the Mara and the Serengeti. And in fact, he spent most of the time talking, but we didn't mind because of course, from our point of view, even though we'd been asked to come and talk to him, hey, you know, a couple of hours with Bill Gates telling you how the world is gonna look was pretty damn amazing. 
but it was also a little bit frightening because at one point he said, you know, he said, look, there's going to come a time where people won't need to travel to Africa. They won't need to come and experience the Serengeti or the Mara. We will just rig up everywhere with webcams and we'll just stream it right into your front living room. There'll be no worries about getting malaria, you know, getting sick, all the hassles of travel. And I said, but hang on a minute. I said, you know, tourism, and my goodness, aren't we feeling it now? Tourism is the mainstay of the way that we are conserving these wild places. And I said, if that happens, I just hope that there's going to be some kind of license fee or whatever it is, because it will kill stone dead, one, the wonder of being able to go and experience these places firsthand. And secondly, what about the revenue? And he sort of stopped and said, mm, no, you know, you're right. But it was also interesting, too, because he made another fascinating comment about, I remember somebody saying, I think it was Julius Nereri, the first president of independent Tanzania, or Tanganyika to Tanzania. And he said, you know, one of our problems is the rest of the world is running and we're walking. How are we going to catch up? And he said a very empowering thing. He, and we've seen this in Kenya. He said, if you look at radio, television, um, electricity, whatever it is, it almost wipes the slate clean and gives everybody of that generation who's born and living at that particular time a chance to start from scratch. And look at how in Africa, we have been liberated in the way that we do business and we exist. People who, you know, maybe earn less than $2 a day, maybe 60% of Kenyans could be, you know, something like that. You know, people living very tough lives, just struggling to make ends meet. And who now will forsake that treat of a Sprite for a card to load money onto their cell phone? And now forget, oh, the rural areas don't know what's going on in the urban areas. Everybody's communicating and talking. And you've got these young Kenyans now full of enterprise and who have managed to hook into this current technology and they've just started. So that was also very refreshing for me. So meeting Bill Gates, it was, you know, that was, it was quite, uh, yeah, it was fascinating. Well, uh, a, a fascinating story. And of course, Bill Gates has been very prominent uh, over here because um, uh, many of the uh, uh, film, uh, uh, TV companies rather, have been interviewing him because he predicted all this. He said, this pandemic is coming and you better watch out and you better be prepared. But I agree totally with you um, uh, about the virtual safari, uh, which is what they call it, uh, really not being uh, something realistic. It'll be entertaining, but it will never be a substitute. No more than this medium that you and I are using right now, Zoom, can be a substitute for the business meeting. You know, at some stage, you're going to want to actually reach across the table uh, and connect with people. So thank goodness for that. Well, Jonathan, in the interest of time, we're going to have to bring this to a close. It's fascinating. We could go on all day, but I want to thank you profusely for uh, giving us your time. And I know our audience will be fascinated and they'll want more. So um, when we get another opportunity, we'd love to have you back and uh, have you tell us some more uh, or give us some more insights into uh, your life and what you do there in, uh, in uh, Nairobi and Kenya. And long may it last. So thank you very much. And um, it's night time for you now in Nairobi. It's morning time for us here. So good night and thank you very much. And thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, bringing Jonathan and making him available to us to uh, spend this fascinating uh, 45 minutes with him. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. It's been wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Bye -bye. Jonathan. Good night, Nairobi. Bye.